or, or have a, a basic understanding and do the old wow, you know. Any of y'all ever flying uh, passenger, commercial passenger planes? Okay. When you're at 30,000 feet, back to actually above about 20,000 feet, the chances of you surviving without the additional oxygen there is not going to be very high. You can survive for a short period of time, but only for a short period of time because the uh, air content or the amount of air is not available enough to sustain life, our life, at those altitudes. So next time you're flying here, 35,000 feet, don't go into a panic, but stay on the inside of the cab. <laughs> yeah. uh, in fact, actually the atmosphere, most of the atmosphere, the actual air molecules are below 18,000 feet. And you hear about people having problems when they climb Mount Everest, dying of, of uh, uh, actually oxygen depletion. That's what happens is there's just not enough air molecules there for them to be able to sustain a normal uh, uh, breathing and all, and it can kill. But it's amazing to me that when we look at our atmosphere that we, we, we say that it's about 100,000 uh, feet in its actual dimension or, or, or height, but yet most of it's going to be, most of the molecules are going to be 18,000 feet and under. Okay, that's, that's just a little fun, a little something to think about. All right, let's, let's get into some of the definitions that I talked about a little bit earlier. A BTU. What is a BTU? Okay. A British Thermal Unit. British Thermal Unit. It, to get a little bit of description on what that is, is, is the amount of heat required to raise one pound of water one degree. Okay? It's the way that we measure the amount of heat. Not the temperature. Temperature is measured, put it this way, temperature indicates how much activity is happening with that substance in the molecules. Okay, heat and temperature aren't the same. You can have something that's hot but may not contain as many BTUs in it as, an, as, as another substance that's at the same temperature. Okay, and that is the BTU, like I say, it takes one uh, BTU to raise one pound of water one degree. At the same time, in order for the uh, one pound of water to drop one degree, it's going to have to lose one BTU. Now, that is called the specific heat of water. Every substance is going to have a different specific heat. You take iron, for example. Iron's not going to have the same specific heat as water. Matter of fact, you would think that iron may be higher, but it's not. It's only about 0.1 BTUs per pound that's required to raise it one degree. Water's a pretty good substance when it comes to transferring heat. In fact, it's a very good substance. Um, the specific heat is uh, a it's going to have a direct relationship on what the BTU does to it. Now there's another kind of heat that we do measure with a temperature, and that's called sensible heat. Sensible heat we can measure, we can feel, okay? If I raise the temperature in here from 72 to 75, that's five degrees of sensible heat increase. And we definitely can feel that. And that's uh, not to be confused with BTUs. Please don't confuse those two together. Now, before I get into a little more about um, some of the specific and sensible and, and latent heat, which I haven't described yet, I want to talk a little more about conversions from Fahrenheit to centigrade because we need to know how to do that. Like I said before, in this country we usually stay with the Fahrenheit scale and not Celsius or centigrade, but we still need to know how to do the conversion. Now if you can, you can take a look at this formula over here. If you can see this formula over here on the board, on the board, the two formulas. And that is our conversion there. If you want to get down to it, the Fahrenheit 
actually has more divisions and is a actually a more of uh, accurate way of measuring than the centigrade is. But centigrade, the beauty of centigrade is, is it's based on uh, the uh, 10. So things work out very well in mathematical problems, whereas Fahrenheit is not based on 10. But those conversions, you can take a look at that and, and uh, see how it's done. Now, how often should you have to convert one temperature to another? I hope never. Now that sounded kind of bad after I told you you needed to. Now I'm saying that I hope you don't ever have to. The job that I had, I worked at a scientific facility. And when you start trying to convert from Fahrenheit to centigrade or, or centigrade back to Fahrenheit, you're bound to make a mistake. If you're working with something that is in Celsius or centigrade, learn how to work with those figures. It's, it's, it's very easy. And I'll give you some guidelines now that, that will help you out so that you, it helps you uh, think through it. Number one, water boils at 100 degrees centigrade, which is equivalent to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? That's one of the points that we know. All right? Water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. What would that be in centigrade? Zero. Zero. Okay. Now, somewhere in between 20 degrees Fahrenheit is equivalent to 68 degrees, excuse me, 20 degrees centigrade is equivalent to, to uh, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. That's another one that we would be commonly around. Now, how about minus 40? Yeah, same. Same. I'm, you're, on, you're on your toes. A lot of people don't know that. I usually throw that out there like that, minus 40, and don't say centigrade or, or uh, Fahrenheit. They go, well, what? Centigrade or Fahrenheit? Doesn't matter. It's the same point. You know, I said there's no such thing as cold. But well, let me tell you, if you stick your hand on something that's minus 40, it doesn't matter whether it's centigrade or Fahrenheit, it's going to be cold. Okay. Now, another thing that we need to understand is where the heat comes from. I said something about the lights actually producing heat in here. We also produce heat. These are, are considered as loads that ha we have to take care of in the HVACR field. One watt is equal to uh, 3.41 BTUs of, of heat. Okay? So if I have a lamp, for example, and I know these are fluorescent, but that so, well, they're not that hot. Go back to what I said about temperature. It's not the temperature, it's the amount of heat that's produced. Okay, if I have 160 watts there per lamp, and I multiply that times, uh, not per lamp, but per fixture, and I multiply that times 3.416 actually, you'll find out that there's going to be a lot more heat in this room being produced than you really realize. A person, a person gives off two kinds of heat. This only gives off sensible heat. A person gives off two kinds of heat, both latent and sensible. Average person in a classroom is going to produce about 300 BTUs of sensible heat and about 300 degrees of latent heat, which we haven't really discussed latent heat, but we're, we're going to do very shortly. Okay. All those are loads that we have to take in consideration when we're doing uh, load calculations or even when we're doing some troubleshooting sometimes. And I'll give you an example of that. Let's say that a uh, store maybe puts a new piece of equipment in and suddenly they can't keep their air conditioner satisfied anymore. Well, that, that new piece of equipment will be producing heat as it operates, which the air conditioner now has to take that heat and transfer it to the outside. So if you have exceeded the capacity of the air conditioning, it's bound to heat up into the uh, room itself. A kilowatt, you know, we said watts a while ago. Well, we, we measure the electricity that we use in kilowatts, which is 1,000 watts. Okay? Electricity is a, a funny thing. We don't pay for electricity. We pay for the power that the electricity produces. And that's where we, we, we get our power bill is for the amount of power that we have used. But 1,000 watts is a kilowatt. Now, one of the most misunderstood, in my opinion, 
terms that comes about is a horsepower. Now, when we talk horsepower, it's a rate of work, but did you hear that first word? Rate of work. Okay. The reason horsepower is misunderstood is because you can have something with a lot of horsepower, but if it doesn't have a whole lot of torque, it's not going to do a whole lot. It's a combination, but the bottom line, horsepower is measured in a time rate. So keep that in mind. I know we see a lot of horsepower ratings on compressors, we see them on motors, etc., 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 but it still comes down to how much power is available there and over what length of time. Okay? Uh, the guy that came up with the horsepower, it was based on what a particular animal, I think it was a, a, uh, a mule or a horse, could actually move in an amount of time. He had to come up with some kind of figure, some kind of way of, of uh, doing it mathematically. Well, he used a educated, if you will, guesstimation. And it's not a bad way to do things, it's just a, a unit of measurement. That's all it is. Latent heat that I said I was going to put off to a little bit later, I'm there now. Latent heat is a heat that we can't see. We can't feel it, but we can, I say we can't see, we can't feel it, but we can see what it does. Okay, when a substance changes its, its uh, structure from either a solid to a liquid, or from a liquid to a gas, it goes through a latent heat process. Now that latent heat actually has to take, it, it takes energy to make that happen or it has to lose energy to go back into the form that it was before. I, I like to think of solids and gases, liquids, as being a lot like a puzzle. Now, if you've ever got a jigsaw puzzle, and you dumped it out when you first got it, the pieces are scattered everywhere. Okay? You can think of that as the way the molecules would be in a gas. They're scattered. There's no real form there. They're loose. As you start putting that, that puzzle together, it starts taking form. You may say that at that point it's becoming a liquid. It's beginning to take form. When you get it to where it's all together, you may say that's a solid. And that's one way to think, take a look at the way the molecules of the difference between a solid and a liquid and a gas. Okay. I've got to throw a little safety in here. Temperatures and pressures. We work with extreme temperatures and pressures. You must take precautions. Frostbite is, I don't even know if I want to call it frostbite. It burns. If you get liquid refrigerant on you, you will get burned. Okay? R22, when it hits the atmosphere as a liquid, it boils at about minus 44 degrees. That will put blisters on you. Again, keep in mind that we're going to be having pressures. Some of the pressures that we deal with, especially in the oxyacetylene tanks, may be 2,500 pounds of pressure. So keep those things in mind. As long as they're contained and, and, and controlled, there's no problem. Yes? Um, what is the uh, temperature of uh, 410A? 410A, I'd have to get on the chart, which we can do, but I'd have to get on the chart. So happens I just know R22 by heart. <laughs> but I'd be glad to look that up. All right. okay. uh, let's conclude this part of our video lecture and we'll move into something else in just a moment.